please join me in welcoming Suyin Juliet Lee, who will introduce Christian Book, like many of our introducers. Oh, sure. So Christian will plug himself in. Um, Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for attending, and you know, of course, kudos to the Kelly Writers House for organizing and Sarah Dowling for her role. Uh, I'm so thrilled to introduce Christian Book. Um, if you aren't familiar with Christian Book's work, the best way I can describe it is to ask you to imagine a French author, Raymond Roussel, Serbian inventor, Nikola Tesla, and American vocalist, Bobby McFerrin, had a Canadian love child. <laughs> who suckled the pages of the OED. Book is an elegant, incandescent, poetic contortionist of the highest caliber. He's the author of three texts. In the first, Crystallography from Coach House in 94, he renders the atomic structures of gems into calligrams, deftly weaving together narrative, geology, and wordplay. However, he's best known for a second test, Unoya, published in 2001, also by Coach House, which earned the Griffin Prize for Poetry in 2002. An extensive lipogram, Unoya includes various constraints, most famously limiting each chapter's lexicon to words containing only a single vowel. He draws much of his inspiration from unlikely reservoirs, such as bathos and the avant-garde. And part of the magic of his poetry is seeing how literary history, pop culture, and etymological research combine. His critical study, Pataphysics, the Poetics of an Imaginary Science, explores Alfred Jerry's legacy and influence in writing by the French Ulipoists, Italian Futurists, and Canadian Jerryites. Pataphysics coined by Jerry is the science of imaginary solutions and invites us to interpret reality as the exception in all the realms of possibility rather than the rule. Book study includes what feels like a poetic statement of his own, a call to, quote, embrace the nature of sophistic reasoning in order to dispute the power of the real and true, end quote. Though his work embraces abstraction and theoretical inquiry, he rigorously emphasizes language's embodiment. His readings are often percussively agile, requiring the labial dexterity and breath control of a beatboxer or a concert flautist. He's a heavyweight in contemporary avant-garde writing. He has composed in alien tongues, written poems to appear in DNA, and I cannot wait to hear what he has to say today. Please help me welcome Christian Book. Uh, my lecture today uh, is delivered in three parts, three chapters, which take the form of a Borgesian narrative about a virus from outer space, uh, a kind of nightmarish pataphysical story uh, interwoven throughout the history of genetics. Everything in this lecture is, in fact, true. This first chapter is entitled Phage, 
Phi X174. The virus was first detected on Earth in 1935 when the pathologist Nicholas Bulgakov, brother of the Soviet writer Mikhail Bulgakov, was working at the Pasteur Institute conducting a census of organic samples collected from the sewers of Paris. The virus was isolated and cultured by Bulgakov, who learned that the newly found life form could infect the enteric microbe E. coli. The virus proved to be uncannily geometric in its structure when later seen under an electron microscope, since the virus resembled an icosahedron, a perfect faceted capsule of protein containing an annular plasmid of genetic material. The virus could inject this package of alien genes into a host cell so as to commandeer the metabolic machinery of the infected organism, replicating the virus more than 1,000-fold until the virus overwhelmed its host, finally killing it. This image is, in fact, a x-ray image of the actual crystal uh, from this particular virus. The virus went on to become the first life form on Earth to have its genome completely sequenced by humans in 1977, when Frederick Sanger, winner of the Nobel Prize for this achievement, determined that the virus contained only 11 genes, encoded by a mere 5,386 bases, far fewer than expected. The virus appeared to be capable of compressing its genome into a short but dense chain of information by using overlapping interleaved instructions to encode more than one protein simultaneously within a single series of nucleotides. At the time, no biochemist could readily explain the origin for such efficient sequences of genes, all of which remained conserved, unchanged, for aeons, despite selective pressures of mutation. A single chain change at any site within such a genome could compromise many functions of the life form, yet it thrived in the face of these threats. And here you have an actual depiction of the genome of this virus. The virus seems so perfectly intricate, despite the tiny size of its genome, that for some scientists, only intelligent engineering could account for the complexity of such a life form. Consequently, Hiromitsu Yoku and Tairo Ashima, working at laboratories in Tokyo, set out to demonstrate the artificiality of this genome in 1979, focusing attention upon this peculiar sequence of 121 codons shared across gene A and gene B, the instructions for two entirely distinct prote uh, proteins preserved within this single sequence of nucleotides. The scientists mapped these codons onto a grid of pixels, 11 by 11 units in size. And here you see that grid, 11 by 11 units in size. And they did so in the hope of detecting a bitmapped geometric glyph that might signify a message sent from outer space by extraterrestrials. The researchers used six different but plausible techniques for decipherment of this genetic segment, but no intelligible mathematical imagery was disclosed in any of these resulting grid works. These images depict the results of blackening out sets of specified letters from the sequence of codons in order to see what images might result. And the two scientists here have exhausted all the possible permutations established by this systematic procedure of experimentation. But alas, we do not see much evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence at work in this particular sample. The virus did not appear to contain a glyph from outer space. However, the scientist Hiroshi Nakamura revisited this research again in 1982, and he suggested that within the 11 by 11 grid, 
all the codons containing a triplet of identical oligomers, AAA, CCC, GGG, and TTT, could be connected to create a figure that appeared to correspond to the positions of stars in the vicinity of the constellation Buotes, as seen from the planet Earth, <laughs> leading him to speculate that the virus could in fact contain a star chart, a secret message indicating to its readership the stellar address of its author. He also studied analogous sequences of DNA found in SV40, a virus capable of causing cancer in apes. And likewise, he claimed to have detected evidence for the existence of a map depicting a constellation in the vicinity of the star Epsilon Eridani, 10 light years away. Now you can compare this particular drawing derived from this grid of codons to this image, the asterism of Buotes, uh, in which, of course, uh, the brightest star is Arcturus. I'll let you contemplate that for a second. <laughs> the virus eventually became the first organism in the history of the Earth to be fabricated from scratch by computers in 2003 when Craig Venter used automated chemistry to combine the component molecules of this life form into a viable genome. And by doing so, he demonstrated that humans now had the skills to design synthetic organisms unseen anywhere in nature. The virus born of this digital process inspired research later used by Venter in 2010 to create the first synthetic bacterium nicknamed Cynthia a mycoplasma with an artificially manufactured genome, an organism depicted here in its petri dish. He watermarked this newly built germ by grafting into it a gene that enciphered a quote from a portrait of the artist as a young man. To live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. He had thus preserved a sample of modern poetry in the first cells of an embryonic, synthetic ecosystem. The virus continues to persist in the imagination of scientists who hope to exploit its parasitism in the fight against superbugs resistant to antibiotics. But despite the fact that this life form has occasionally fomented a kind of apophenia, resulting in a frantic pursuit for an encoded message embedded within its genome. Humans have so far failed to read the signature left there by some recondite but invisible sentience. We have instead become the alien force whose rubaiyats we seek, since we can now transmit our own messages across stellar distances or apochal intervals by storing them durably within cells. We can harness such life, exploiting its power not only to recopy itself with few errors, but to modify itself for the better, all in the face of random change. We are now on the verge of writing truly alive books, perusable by other minds around other stars. This is chapter two, the Xenotext. This chapter is sufficiently pretentious enough to have its own epigraph. <laughs> a quote uh, taken from uh, the Technical Manifesto of Futurist Literature by F.T. Marinetti, who notes that there is also a microbe essential to the vitality of art. I would like to talk a little bit about this microbe. The Xenotext is a kind of experiment, a literary exercise that explores the aesthetic potential of genetics in the modern milieu, doing so in order to make literal the renowned aphorism of William S. Burroughs, who has declared that the word is now a virus. My experiment proposes to address some of the sociological implications of biotechnology by manufacturing a Xenotext, a beautiful anomalous poem whose alien words might subsist like a harmless parasite inside the cell of another life form. 
Futurists have already begun to speculate that even now we might store data by encoding textual information into genetic nucleotides, thereby creating messages made from DNA. Messages that we can then implant like genes inside cells where such data might persist undamaged and unaltered through myriad cycles of mitosis, all the while preserved for recovery and decoding. Genetics has thus endowed biology with a possible literary use, granting every geneticist the power to become a poet in the medium of life. Now, I have composed my own example of living poetry so that when translated into a gene and then integrated into the cell, the text nevertheless gets expressed by the organism, which in response to this grafted genetic sequence begins to manufacture a viable benign protein, one that, according to the original chemical alphabet, is itself yet another text. I am, in effect, engineering a primitive bacterium so that it becomes not only a durable archive for storing a poem, but also a usable machine for writing a poem in response. Now, this image actually depicts uh, the rubber-eating, viroidal creature featured, of course, in the movie The Andromeda Strain. You can compare that to this image. This is the host organism for my poem, Dinococcus radiodurans. It is the proposed symbiote for my xenotext, in part because this extremophile can repair its own DNA so quickly that the germ resists mutation. It can survive extremes of heat and cold, even desiccation. Scorch it, freeze it, dry it out, and still it endures. It can survive exposure to the open vacuum of outer space. It can even withstand dosages of gamma rays 1,000 times more lethal than the dosage needed to obliterate a human being. A germ with this kind of radio resistance might conceivably survive an asteroid impact or a nuclear war. And some biologists, including Anatoly K. Pavlov and others, have even gone so far as to suggest that the ancestor of this organism must be extraterrestrial in its origin in order to have acquired all of these environmental immunities. Writing the xenotext requires that I create a chemical alphabet of codons, of genetic triplets, made by permuting the four nucleotides in DNA, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, represented, of course, in popular culture by the letters A, C, G, and T. Each of these codons, these genetic triplets, made from one of these four letters, is a, effectively a three-letter word. A codon is effectively a three-letter word made in DNA, a word that the cell interprets as an instruction for creating one of 20 amino acids used to make a sequence of proteins. A protein is effectively nothing more than a sequence of amino acids derived from the codons of the DNA molecule. Now, I can assign each amino acid to a given letter of the alphabet, and by stringing these codons together, I can create chemical messages, enciphered as sequences of DNA. Now, this diagram depicts something of the codependent molecular relationship between uh, the various nucleotides in DNA. There, there exists a codependent biochemical relationship between any preliminary DNA sequence and its resulting messenger RNA sequence, which creates the string of amino acids in the protein. And my two poems must likewise be bijectively codependent in order for this project to work. Just as adenine and thymine mutually encipher each other, wherever you see it, A in one sequence, you will see T in the other, and vice versa, so also do cytosine and guanine mutually encipher each other. So wherever you might see a G in one sequence, you'll see a C in the other, and vice versa. With the extra molecule here represented uracil, represented by the letter U, standing in for thymine during the process of transcription into messenger RNA. Wherever you might normally see a thymine molecule, it is replaced with a uracil molecule during transcription into messenger RNA. Now, my two poems must effectively mimic this process of mutual encipherment and translation in order for me to be able to encode them 
into the biochemical processes of this organism. Let us now imagine pairing off all the letters of the alphabet so that they are mutually assigned. Knowing that there exist 7 trillion, 905 billion, 853 million, 580,625 different ways of enciphering the alphabet according to this one constraint. <laughs> now choose a cipher from this set, one that you think might actually produce interesting results. Then write an eloquent poem such that if we replace every single letter with its counterpart from our chosen cipher, we get yet another eloquent poem. Now, no poet in the history of poetics has ever actually imagined creating two texts that mutually encipher each other. I plan, however, to integrate my encoded text into the genetic code of the cell so that during transcription, the messenger RNA in the cell might translate my string of codons into the required commands for manufacturing a correspondent series of amino acids except that through this act of biochemical translation, this series of amino acids must also encipher a totally variant poem. I'm trying, in effect, to design a biological cryptogram that consists of a meaningful text that can, in turn, be deciphered into yet another meaningful text. Now, in this image, I presented to you a very arbitrary sample cipher in order to illustrate how this process works. And you might notice that, for example, the letter E in this particular code, which translates the word cell by me into the word glee by the germ. The letter E here might be enciphered by a preliminary DNA codon. I've just arbitrarily chose CCG, which gets transcribed by the cell into its correlative RNA codon, GGC, the mutually transposed variation on that codon. And that new codon represents the instruction for creating the amino acid glycine, which might in turn then be assigned, perhaps arbitrarily in this case, to the letter L. By connecting those two letters together, E and L, I've established a mutually codependent relationship between them. The letters E and L are thus correlated uh, to each other by the codependent biochemical relationship between the DNA sequence and the RNA sequence. Hence, the letter L must be represented by the preliminary DNA codon GGC. It has the same molecule, which gets transcribed by the cell into its correlative RNA codon, CCG, the codon originally given to the letter E. And this codon represents the instruction for creating the amino acid proline, which in this case has been assigned to that letter E. All the letters of the alphabet must follow this constraint of codependent encipherment in order for the project to work. To compose such a poem, I've had to design a piece of homespun software. I've had to become a computer programmer. And this software permits me to input a cipher into a computer, which might then search through the entirety of the English lexicon, outputting all the words that mutually encipher each other according to my requisite constraint. And I've experimented with all kinds of heuristics, correlating letters that have, for example, equivalent recurrence in text or equivalent positioning in words, and I've even explored codes that force the inclusion of a particular vocabulary. I've tried all kinds of different rules of thumb in order to generate interesting results. I've run hundreds and hundreds of experiments with this software, and I have yet to find a vocabulary larger than 786 entries. There is no vocabulary, I think, larger than 786 entries. And most of the results include only a very disconsolate array of monosyllabic words, most shorter than five letters. And I have found that shorter deictic words, really useful words like the, and, of, in, etc., all required for coherent syntactic discourse, do not encode very easily into any of these lexicons. And often, a very common usable word might translate into a very exotic but useless word. And any word of more than six letters is extremely rare. Most of the ciphers produced uh, cannot, in fact, say anything intelligible. After nearly four years of failure in trying to write two intelligible texts, I mean two texts that could be even reducible to two meaningful sentences, failing to do this, being unable to fulfill this burdensome constraint, I have finally made the prerequisite breakthrough for my project about six months ago. 
I present to you uh, the Zeno text. The text on the left is, in fact, by me. This is the text that I would encipher as a sequence of DNA codons. And it reads, any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre. With wily ploys, moan the riff. The riff of any tune allowed. Moan now my fate. In fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. The organism is going to interpret the sequence of DNA codons, which encipher this poem. It interprets it as a set of instructions for producing a sequence of amino acids, for producing a protein, which enciphers the poem on the right. The poem on the right is by the microbe. And it writes, the fairy is rosy of glow. In fate, we rely. Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay, oh stay, my lyre. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy. <laughs> now the, uh, thank you, I appreciate the, the applause. The uh, code is uh, featured at the top of this image and uh, showcases how the letters are mutually correlated. So for example, wherever you see the A in one poem, you'll see a T in the other and vice versa. Wherever you see uh, uh, an N in one poem, you'll see an H in the other and vice versa. The text on the left is written by me, I think, as a kind of masculine assertion about the aesthetic creation of life. <laughs> While the text on the right is written by the microbe, I think, as a feminine refutation about the woebegone absence of life. The two poems resemble abbreviated Petrarchan sonnets in dialogue with each other. They are, in fact, 14 lines with octaves and sestets. And they're written, I think, much like poems in the elegiac pastoral tradition of the herd boy and the nymphette. <laughs> Moreover, the protein that enciphers the poem by the microbe is going to be chemically tagged so as to make the cell glow red in the dark. The microbe is, in effect, going to fluoresce rubescently in a fey way that embodies the rosiness attributed to the fairy described within the content of the poem itself. That is, in fact, the method uh, used to determine that the organism is, in fact, expressing this particular protein. Now, I've had to explore numerous options for enciphering the poem as a sequence of amino acids, since the sequence must result in a viable uh, chain of amino acids capable of folding up viably into a real working protein. Now, I've done statistical analyses of various ciphers, determining their likelihood of surviving within the organism, determining the likelihood of them folding up very compactly into uh, a lovely molecule. And I have narrowed my candidates after several dozen uh, attempts down to about one dozen ranked options. And I've submitted these candidate proteins to a supercomputer, which has taken about six weeks to simulate merely two femtoseconds of folding for each protein. And I've also submitted a 13th wildcard candidate, merely out of curiosity. And while my predicted contenders uh, do in fact rank highly, the best one turns out to be this 13th candidate protein 13. And this chart depicts the cipher used to encode my poem into this specific sequence of amino acids. This is, in effect, the uh, chart which uh, identifies the encoding process for protein 13, which is, in fact, uh, the best uh, way of enciphering uh, the poem so that it can survive viably within the organism. This image depicts the sequence of DNA codons used to generate protein 13 within the cell. Each codon is assigned to a letter of the alphabet. And for example, in this case, uh, ACG represents the letter A, GTG represents the letter N, ATA is Y, and AAG is a space. So that the first four codons encode the word any plus the letter space. The full sequence enciphers my poem about the aesthetic creation of life. This is effectively what it would look like as a sequence of nucleotides. 
This image depicts the sequence of amino acids encoding the poem written by the microbe in response to my text. And here, each amino acid is conventionally represented by a letter of the alphabet, so that, for example, uh, the letter T represents threonine, V is valine, I is isoleucine, and S is serine. And in this case, the first four letters of this sequence enciphers the word the plus a letter space. The sequence encodes the poem written by the microbe in response to my implanted text. This is, in effect, the uh, way in which the organism uh, recognizes my poem. Now, this image is the resultant protein from that specific sequence of amino acids. Uh, the image uh, depicts the backbone of the resulting protein after two femtoseconds of folding. Uh, this really depicts what the poem is expected to look like at an atomic level within the cell. And I can provide to you an actual atomic molecular structure of the protein in this image. Uh, this is, in fact, the molecular embodiment of the xenotext, a kind of sculptural translation of the poem itself. Uh, it can, in fact, be manipulated in a 3D space. You can actually look at it from many perspectives. Here I've just taken a snapshot of it from this kind of uh, perspective, which makes it look like a head of broccoli. <laughs> and I fully expect to uh, build a model of this protein out of toy molecules uh, for exhibit in a gallery. This, in fact, would be a sculpture that would embody the xenotext. Chapter 3. Such a project, of course, raises many questions about the ludic usage of the very materials out of which life itself is created. I have, in effect, transformed poetry into an act of exploratory biogenetic gamesmanship, a game of translation, which has implications for poetry in a world where genetic engineering and digital technologies are merging into a kind of super science, one that studies life itself at the very extremes of its own definition. So I'd like to present to you the game of life. Life is a discrete cellular automaton invented in 1970 by the mathematician John Conway, who sets out to play an imaginary game of computation on an infinite field within a two-dimensional universe. The field is subdivided into a grid of square pixels or cells, each of which exists in one of two binary states, either live or dead. In this respect, I guess we all live in a binary state. <laughs> Either live or dead, depending upon the status of the other eight cells surrounding it in the adjacent vicinity. Any live cell can continue to live only if it has an optimal number of live neighbors. No fewer than two, but no more than three. If it has more than three, it dies from overcrowding. If it has fewer than two neighbors, it dies of loneliness. Any live cell goes dead if its number of live neighbors, uh, excuse me, any live cell goes dead if its number of live neighbors falls outside this range. Any dead cell can, in turn, go live only if it has exactly three live neighbors within its immediate proximity. Now, a computer can apply these rules recursively to an initial pattern of live cells so that the pattern evolves over many generations, perhaps expanding endlessly to fill the flatland of its cosmos. Life evolves in a manner that is predetermined, yet unpredictable. The pixels of the game seethe with activity like subatomic particles in a super collider. The evolution of an initial pattern often produces emergent order out of apparent chaos, until finally the pattern reaches one of three entropic outcomes. All the cells vanish completely from the grid, resulting in a spinal state of extinction. All the cells attain a crystalline state, preserving a fixed phase of stasis, or all the cells attain an oscillatory state, repeating a fixed cycle of change. The algorithm generates surprising complexity, despite the simplicity of the given rules. And mathematicians have even found patterns that behave like components in minuscule machinery, shuttles and switch engines, gunships and puffer engines, clockwork factories that emit squadrons of gliders flying across the 2D void to infinity. Life has become even more compelling since the announcement in 2010 that the physicist Andrew Wade has used life 
to arrange 846,278 live cells into a machine called Gemini, a titanic pattern capable of fabricating a subsequent clone of itself while dismantling its antecedent model, doing so over the course of 33,699,586 generations. Even though mathematicians have already proven that the game of life is a universal Turing machine capable of performing any kind of computation, as shown, for example, by hobbyists who have actually used life to build computers for calculating prime numbers. Gemini is the first bitmapped automaton to replicate itself in a lifelike manner. And this discovery has renewed long-term interest in the possibility of creating synthetic organisms through the use of cellular automata. The game itself might someday become a digitized ecosystem of evolving viroidal creatures laboring toward their own kind of embryonic sentience. Let's imagine what might happen if artists, driven by inquisitiveness, go on to translate the genomes of bacteriophages into grids of cells, subjecting the resulting patterns to the rules of life in order to see how these patterns might evolve under the strictures of this algorithm. Might not such artists discover by accident that a given virus contains a message from outer space? a message compressed into an icon which a discrete cellular automaton might decompile like a program into a complex kinetic picture fraught with poetic import. Might not the curiosity of poets drive them to translate the great works of literature into binary arrays of pixels so as to derive from these works their implicit patterns of evolution within life itself? What insights might await a poet who plots the metamorphosis of a poem within such an ecosystem, one governed by unknown but inhuman laws of aesthetic selection. What might we learn from these experiments? The image here depicts the algorithm of life applied to the first grid of codons from phage 5x174. And as you can see, the picture evolves inside the tiny cage of its ecosystem until finally it stagnates after only six generations, repeating the same fossilized bitmapped fragment. The images here, likewise, depict the algorithm applied to two more grids of codons from phage 5x174, just to see how these images might evolve. I suppose that I'm using these experiments as a method for converting the textual information of a genome into a kind of abstract comic with its own pictorial narrative, a kind of cinematic experience of visual poetry depicted frame by frame for the duration of its ability to endure within its tiny ecosystem. This image uh, depicts a, a slightly more robust uh, grid of codons, uh, the fourth grid. Uh, it's a little more robust than the other three you've seen because it can survive for 41 generations before finally falling into a stagnating, oscillating routine. These grids of codons eventually evolve toward a state of extinction in which all pixels disappear from the screen. And alas, uh, we do not see much evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence in the progress of these cellular automata in the course of their evolution. But who knows, in some virus, we might. Okay, how might we apply this process of algorithmic translation to a poem itself? in order to determine its long-term viability within the universe of life? How might we transform a text into a work of visual poetry, if not into a kind of kinetic version of abstract cinema? And here you have a bitmapped hieroglyph, which depicts a translation of the xenotext into a machine-readable QR code, which, of course, can be scanned by your smartphone, thereby transmitting the poem directly to your device where you can read the text on your own screen. Those of you who come equipped can certainly do so if you like. You should be able to uh, read this poem directly into your phone. Let's imagine using this translation of the text into a bitmapped array as an ecosystem within the universe of life. How might it evolve? Using the algorithm of life, we can see how this bitmapped translation of the poem might evolve over time as a computer organism 
in the 2D cosmos imagined by the mathematician Conway. The pixels seethe in their tiny cage, colonizing new terrain, competing for resources, some areas dying out while other areas regain islands of stability amid the chaos. Now I can imagine translating into this regime a variety of poems by different writers from different schools in order to compare how they might persist under the rules of this algorithm in order to see which of them constitutes the fittest for survival within this universe. And in conclusion, the Xenotext ultimately strives to infect the language of genetics with the poetic vectors of its own discourse, doing so in order to extend poetry itself beyond the formal limits of the book. I foresee that as poetry adapts to the millennial condition of such innovative technology, a poem might soon resemble a weird genre of science fiction, and a poet might become a breed of technician working in a linguistic laboratory. And I hope that my project might provoke debates about the future of science and poetics. My project merely highlights the degree to which the modern social new new has now taken for granted that the discursive structures of epidemiology, as seen, for example, in such notions as viral marketing or viral computing, might apply to the transmission of ideas throughout our culture. If the poet plays host to the germ of the word, then the poet may have to invent a more innovative vocabulary to describe this epidemic called language. And I feel that my project goes some way toward fulfilling this function. I also believe that such a poem might begin to demonstrate that through the use of nanoscopic biological emissaries, we might begin to transmit messages across stellar distances or even apochal intervals, so that unlike any other cultural artifacts so far produced, except perhaps for the pioneer probes or the voyager probes, such a poem stored inside the genome of a bacterium might conceivably outlast terrestrial civilization itself persisting like a secret message in a bottle flung at random into a giant ocean. Even though poets may pay due homage to the immortality of their heritage, few of us have ever imagined that we might actually create a literary artifact capable of outliving the existence of our species, an artifact that might testify to our cultural presence upon the planet until the very hour when at last the sun itself explodes. I hope that by fulfilling this experiment, I might encourage other poets to consider the long-term timeline of our aesthetic evolution to think beyond the formal limits of our own inevitable extinction. <laughs> Thank you very kindly uh, for your patience. I don't know if we in fact have time for questions or not. Five minutes, okay. I will do my best to uh, respond to questions or concerns uh, that you might have about uh, this project. Yes, Lisa. First of all, I applaud you for your research. Mm -hmm. um, second, um, I think that Lucretius was describing the Xenotext as a mathematical construct. Here we go. Um, so, did I, I think that Lucretius beat him to it. Um, <laughs> So Sewer embarked on um, a later abandoned, abandoned thread of inquiry where he was reading the opening of De Rerum Natura, the opening being the invocation of Venus where mm -hmm. um, the goddess of natality um, fucks Mars um, in order to cause war to cease so mm -hmm. that language can come forth. Um, in this poem, um, so Sewer saw the um, scattered phonemes of the name Aphrodite, the other name for Venus, um, distributed through the texture of the poem. Um, and he believed these scattered phonemes of Aphrodite in the language of the poems um, were, if you like the, the codons of life mm -hmm. itself. Yes. Um, so that um, the poem itself, De Rerum Natura, by um, embedding in its structure this um, molecular, um, um, mo molecular code of um, life as divinity, mm -hmm. was um, doing its task to perpetuate um, um, natural life on the planet. 
Now, Saussure abandoned this thread of inquiry, but um, it was found in his notebooks um, in Geneva um, by Jean Starobinsky. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so so the problem of uh, detecting anagrams uh, about the names of gods that are somehow yes, dispersed uh, uh, throughout a text. And the question, yes, I guess, that arises: Are they the product of intentionality, or are they the product of uh, uh, a kind of accident that is incipient within well, uh, the arrangement of Well, he didn't have the atoms. computers. Yes. But, <laughs> as you did. <laughs> but I, th I think he already did it. Well, uh, I, I think that in my case, so to distinguish myself from uh, the model or precedent set by Lucretius, I'm really trying to uh, actually undertake a, a literal dialogue with life itself. Sure. It, but not, it, like, not in the sense of actually integrating and talking directly you know, to, the, to the organism in its own language. Not, not in terms of an actual uh, attempt to speak uh, via the genetic code, you know, a code that nobody would have known about until 67 years ago. And in that sense, in, in, that, sen in that sense, okay, well, you know, I've got a long tradition then behind me. You know, it really supports uh, <laughs> the, 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 the great foundation of this kind of project. Yes? Maybe picking up on a, on a similar thread um, and, and the long tradition idea. So how would you respond if someone said, Looked at this whole project, your presentation of it, said, "Wow, this really ties into one of the oldest poetic tropes: the idea that uh, through my verse I will live forever." Mm -hmm. Or you know, Keats saying, "You know, I, I before my however that Keats poem goes, but you know, contemplating his e the end of his life and the desire to live on sure. through his art." Yeah. Now I I have to say that uh, this work does not testify to any attempt on my part to uh, be immortal, uh, so much as it testifies, I think, uh, to a, a statement about uh, our own inevitable extinction. Uh, the, uh, all, of those, all of those poems, of course, fantasize about the immortality of art, uh, but uh, that's just rhetoric, right, unless you actually uh, have a viable means of preserving it. And in fact, we know of no, we have no known mode of transmission of information across apochal time. Nothing we've made can survive on the planet over apochal time. Uh, our cities, our artworks, uh, even our plastic ski boots, yeah. All of those objects are going to disappear after uh, tens of millions of years, and their uh, record in the fossil record will be minuscule, almost undetectable. Um, in fact, our only legacy to the future over the course of tens of millions of years, if an alien civilization wanted to find evidence of our sentience on the planet, were we to disappear tomorrow, and it showed up on the scene, say, 100 million years from now, the only uh, thing that we might find uh, as evidence of our sentience would in fact be uh, our nuclear waste, uh, which would exceed the normative background radiation uh, of the geological record, uh, the effects of mass extinction caused by Anthropocene activity, uh, that would be preserved in the fossil record and would be attributed, uh, because there's no astronomical evidence of any cause for that extinction, it'd probably be attributed to the presence of a super predator on the planet, one that would have to be intelligent enough to wipe everything out. And uh, thirdly, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, evidence uh, preserved in the ecologies and geological record of climate change uh, induced by human activity. Those are the three things that we delegate as a legacy to our future. Uh, they don't seem excellent <laughs> cultural artifacts. Uh, the only known way we, that we know of of transmitting information sustainably over apochal time is in fact through living things. In our own DNA, uh, there is information that has been preserved there since life first appeared on the planet because it is, in fact, so crucial to the survival of every organism on the planet that uh, uh, those sequences have to be preserved. Uh, and that information has been transmitted through a kind of uh, game of Chinese telephone throughout epochal history to this point today. And in this sense, uh, you know, I'm, trying, I'm trying to play a kind of conceptual game, I suppose, with the very uh, language of genetics itself. Uh, and it truly is a dialogue. You know, some people have complained that I'm merely imposing my will upon this uh, humble organism. <laughs> when in fact, uh, I have had to modify and modulate uh, my own practice entirely <laughs> to suit uh, its uh, genetic, biogenetic constraints. Uh, and you know, as a consequence, it in some sense has imposed its will upon me. Now I think that the, that brings us probably to 315. I do appreciate uh, your patience and uh, graciousness. Uh, we should enjoy our break. Thank you very much. Thank you.